in this class we will be dealing with the second part of nuclear fusion we have already seen what nuclear fusion is it is a process of combination of two lighter nuclei to produce a heavy nucleus in the process a large amount of energy is also released and uh, fusion is known to be uh, known to be present in stars and the source of energy of the stars is essentially nuclear fusion we have seen that uh, in sun or in any uh, in uh, stars we have two types of uh, fusion reactions one is pp proton proton fusion fusion reaction and uh, cn the carbon nitrogen type of fusion reaction and uh, fusion is essentially uh, thermonuclear in nature so what this meant by thermonuclear you require some sort of a temperature or a heat thermo means heat right okay so why you require heat in nuclear fusion the average kinetic energy to overcome coulomb's repulsion between two, hyd two hydrogen nuclei is 1 mev so why uh, we require temperature or a heat or heat is simply because your nuclei will be repelled by the coulomb's uh, force of repulsion so to overcome this coulomb's repulsion and to bring this nuclei together to form or to generate fusion uh, you have to have some sort of an uh, some sort of a kinetic energy you should give some sort of a kinetic energy to the nuclei so uh, to impart kinetic energy the first thing which comes to your mind is some sort of a particle acceleration accelerators you can accelerate your uh, positively charged nuclei so that they will gain very huge velocity and will come and strike each other to produce fusion but um, in this process uh, you will always have uh, energy loss due to scattering so that means your fusion will not be sustainable sustainable in the sense the fusion will not be continued okay because the particles will be losing energy and you cannot have a uh, sustained continued fusion process so what we do is we will be uh, taking the fuel for fusion for example if you are using two hydrogen nuclei to fuse you will be taking the mixture of hydrogen nuclei and will keep this mixture of hydrogen nuclei in very high temperature what temperature so the temperature uh, is calculated in such a way that uh, as you see the average kinetic energy to overcome coulomb's repulsion is 1 mev so what is the temperature equivalent to this energy you know the relation kinetic and average kinetic energy is equal to kt where k is boltzmann constant so you will get a temperature so if you calculate the temperature corresponding to that 1 mev it comes out to be 10 raised to 10 kelvin so if you keep the uh, mixture of uh, if you keep the uh, hydrogen nuclei in this 10 raised to 10 kelvin temperature uh, it is possible that you can have a sustained or a sustainable fusion because this uh, at the high temperature will impart uh, sufficient kinetic energy to have sustainable fusion process so that is why fusion is called thermonuclear to have fusion possible you require very high temperature uh, very very high temperature and it is called thermonuclear in nature now when you are giving a very high temperature to a gas or anything you will end up in a state called plasma so at very high temperatures what happens is collisions and all cause atoms and molecules to lose electrons okay so they will become ions and electrons okay so we'll say that matter is ionized that's a very trivial thing when you increase temperature at a particular temperature ionization happens and uh, matter will ex uh, exist as uh, exists in the ionized state so if the temperature is huge we will be calling that uh, high temperature ionized state as a plasma state that is a fourth state of matter that is fully ionized neutral mixture of ions and electrons which is called a plasma fully ionized means there will not be any neutral particles inside the mixture but the mixture will be neutral what is mean by when meant by the mixture is neutral whatever number of positive charges are there in the mixture equal a number of negative charges will be available in the mixture that is what is meant by the neutral mixture doesn't mean that there will be neutral particles inside okay so plasma is essentially charged particles but they will be neutral in in a collective way they will be neutral 
So if you look onto the distribution of particles in that plasma, that is called, that is if you look onto that, that is essentially a Maxwellian distribution. So that means this is the this uh, curve on the right side shows you a Maxwell 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 Boltzmann distribution, where you have uh, energy particle energy is, is having a range. You have different you have different particles with the different energies. If you go, if you look onto the left side of this figure, here you have a huge number of particles. Here in the left, in the y-axis you have the number of particles, and the x-axis you have the particle energy or temperature. So uh, the, when the energy is less, uh, or uh, at this this area of the curve, you will have more number of particles. Okay. So less energy particles are more, and high energy particles are less. Okay. So the curve is like this. So high energy particles are less. So this curve is for a particular average temperature average temperature that does not mean that all the particles have got the same temperature or same energy so there are particles with the lesser energy and particles with the higher energy so these particles these particles with higher energy which are lesser in number are uh, responsible for nuclear fusion actually high energy particles with the enough energy to permit fusion is on the right side of this curve okay so that is uh, actually the observed this thing some particles have energies greater than the average KT and they actually cause fusion. So this is the area where fusion is happening uh, in nature. So if you look on to the reaction rate of fusion, so uh, this is uh, this curve is actually the Maxwellian which we have seen in the previous slide, the Maxwellian and uh, you have also another parameter known as reaction cross section. Okay. So what is the probability of rea uh, reaction, nuclear reaction or nuclear fusion? That is this curve. That is called a cross section or reaction probability. So uh, if you look onto the reaction probability, it, the, the curve sh tells you that particles with the only higher energies have got some sort of a reaction cross section. This this area you don't have any cross section, any probability for nuclear reaction. This area there are the cross section starts when the energy increases, the cross section or the probability also increases. Okay, so we take actually reaction rate we take as it is the product of number of nuclei and the reaction probability or the cross section. So you take these two curves, the reaction probability and the number of particles. Okay, and you multiply these two curves, multiply these two curves, the left side curve and the right side curve, and you then you will get this uh, this dotted line curve. Okay, and this dotted line curve is actually the product of the this curve and this curve and this is actually the reaction rate and by the geometry of the figure you know that at, at this point at this point uh, this is the point of intersection of the number curve and the cross section or the reaction probability curve and at this point the reaction rate will be maximum because the product will be maximum at this point okay uh, so that is about the reaction rate the reaction rate is not same for all particle energies or particle energies there is a preferable particle energy preferable nuclear energy at which the reaction rate is or the fusion rate is maximum okay so keeping this thing in mind let us uh, have an idea about thermonuclear reaction on earth i already told you that uh, the uh, nuclear fusion is the source of energy uh, in the, the stellar interior or the star energy is essentially the fusion energy okay and uh, if you are thinking about thermonuclear reaction on earth why are we thinking about the fusion reaction on earth uh, we know that the energy needs are day by day increasing uh, we have we, we are spending energy day by day in a very extensive way you know uh, you are uh, driving your cars, you are using electricity, in whatever activity you do, there are some sort of energy spending involved. And the primary fuels which we use today for energy generation is petroleum or biofuels, coal, uh, etc. But these biofuels are expected to be draining out in the near future. May, uh, and uh, some studies tell you that uh, biofuels, the deposit of biofuels will be fully extracted in a, in a half century or so from 50 or 60 years from now you cannot depend on the biofuels and also you know that uh, this uh, problem of um, pollution carbon dioxide emission carbon budget etc etc this uh, greenhouse gases global warming etc they are actually the main culprit is the biofuels the emission from the biofuels so uh, you cannot depend biofuels um, in future as a dependable i mean as a reliable energy source so 
and that is why now people are talking about solar energy solar energy is now widely used somewhat widely used but there are lot of technology issues like uh, uh, you need to require the sunlight all the time otherwise in the night you will not be getting the solar energy but so in, uh, you have to use the solar energy in the night is act, uh, the energy which you are going to use in uh, in the night is actually the stored energy whatever solar energy you get in the day time that should be stored somewhere and should be utilized in the uh, night time so that will be a lot of technological issues involved there storage is a problem it is non reliable uh, as i told you it depends very much on the sunlight and uh, uh, the rainy days and all will be having problems and cost is a very serious issue the establishment cost uh, the storage cost etc for the solar cells is very large so that you cannot afford the of course researches are going on so that solar energy may be a reliable and solar uh, reliable energy source in future but at present it is not so nuclear energy seems to be an alternative uh, of course we do we have a lot of nuclear reactors lot of controversies are also going on that's all we will just uh, forget about that let us concentrate on science science so nuclear energy uh, seems to be an alternative there is no doubt in that uh, because it is available it's uh, once it is established it is available and uh, there are a lot of uh, good things about nuclear energy also which we will not be uh, discussing in a very extensive way in this lecture but nuclear energy you know that there are two types of uh, nuclear energy possible one is fission or fusion fission and fusion okay fission also already we have seen a lot of fission reactors are already in place but fusion reactors are not so uh, not uh, realized even today so what is the difference between fission and fusion in terms of uh, energy production fusion is more energy efficient in contrast with the fission you know that the fission produce for the the typical fission reaction we have discussed is uranium uh, and neutron uranium uh, uh, sorry uranium uh, fission reaction okay uranium fission reaction when the when the uranium is bombarded with the neutron it splits up into two and uh, along with that a lot of energy is produced around 200 Uh, MeV of energy is produced. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, the typical fusion, you know that the hydrogen fusion will produce 20 MeV or 24 MeV of energy. So you may feel that uh, 200 MeV is greater than 24 MeV. So that fusion is better than fusion. It is not like that because uh, you uh, you got 200 MeV of energy from uranium. Uranium is a heavy element with 235 mass. Okay. Uh, so using a 235 mass fuel you go 200 mev whereas fusion you are using hydrogen only which is uh, which uh, whose uh, mass is only your one unit if you are using two hydrogen atoms or three three four hydrogen atoms it's a matter of uh, two or four units of masses and from that you are generating 24 mev so if you are just calculating the energy per kilogram fusion is having 10 is generating 10 raised to 14 joule per kilogram and uh, your fusion will be generating 10 raised to 13 joule per kilogram so there is a map difference of around 10 factor of 10 between fusion and fusion and fusion is more energy efficient and uh, fusion compared to fusion fusion does not produce much nuclear waste nuclear waste means the radioactive uh, uh, things which are produced in the process fusion you will have lot of nuclear fish if you uh, if you perform fission it is observed that you will have lot of radioactive elements produced in the process and that can be a nuclear waste but fusion does not produce that much radioactive waste so in that way it is a clean energy compared to fusion is a clean energy compared compared to uh, fission uh, especially in the aspect of nuclear waste and another thing is uh, that uh, the the, the main criticism regarding fission reactor is that uh, its safety concerns it can be exploded at any time if something is gone beyond control the fission reactor is may uh, end up in uh, in collapse okay explosion of the reactor may happen so but uh, fusion uh, it's always in control in the sense to produce fusion as i already told you to you have to bring two heavy nuclei to uh, lighter nuclei together Uh, that is a very serious and a very difficult process because this nuclei has got uh, coulomb's repulsion uh, by by themselves so to start fusion you have to impose fusion actually you have to bring them together it, uh, if you do not want you do not you know you uh, you do nothing fusion will not be happening 
if you wanted to start fusion you have to bring that if you have to do the difficult job of bringing them together so fusion is always in control if you are sitting idle fusion will not happen uh, so fusion will uh, i mean fusion requires something to be done uh, to be sustainable so it's always in control because uh, it's always in control but uh, the problem is um, problem of fusion to be produced uh, fusion uh, to be happening on earth is uh, it is thermonuclear in nature i we have already seen that uh, you require a large amount of energy you require a large amount of heat uh, to start fusion uh, that much energy is not so possible not so feasible on the surface of earth you cannot produce that uh, that uh, heavy uh, temperature that huge temperature in a controlled way in the on the surface of the earth or that process very difficult but there are certain other techniques in which you can have thermo you can have you can have fusion in sun this high temperature and high nuclear density uh, at that temperature we have got uh, a very high temperature in sun and you have got high nuclear density so the, in that temperature fusion is possible and that condition fusion is possible but it's not so in earth and uh, stellar energy sources like pp cycle and cn cycle are not feasible on earth because they are extremely slow that is again another process because another uh, constraint because uh, sun and the other stars you can have large uh, number of protons and uh, uh, helium whatever they are, whatever nuclear fuel is there but uh, the the time taken for one particular reaction may be uh, very large very large that means that reaction is extremely slow but those slow reactions we cannot use on earth because we want immediate energy you know so we cannot use that so those slow react, uh, slow reactions on earth uh, and if you look onto the uh, fusion on the surface of the earth these are the candidates fusion involving deuterium or tritium are better candidates on earth uh, not the protons in sun you have proton proton cycle here we are dealing with the deuterium and tritium the isotopes of the uh, uh, hydrogen are better candidates for fusion on earth so these are the possible fusion reactions on the surface of the earth uh, here we have listed four reactions one two three four and uh, one and two are dd dd means deuterium deuterium two deuterium are under fusion process in a two different way here 1h2 plus 1h2 giving you helium 3 plus 1 neutron and this much amount of energy so this is deuterium deuterium fusion another deuterium deuterium fusion is also possible that is two deuterium two neutrons deuterium combined together to form a tritium this is tritium actually 1h3 and another proton plus 4 mev so these are the two ways in which deuterium uh, uh, fuse with another deuterium to form uh, energy okay two types of deuterium deuterium reaction dd reaction we will call it as and the third reaction is dt deuterium tritium reaction deuterium tritium that is one deuterium is fusing with one tritium the isotope of hydrogen and you are getting helium and some 17.59 mv of energy so it seems uh, this is much better because here it is uh, only 3 or 4 mev of energy here it is a almost 18 mev of energy and the fourth uh, reaction we are dealing with uh, we can deal with on earth is 1 s2 plus 2 he3 uh, that is helium 3 this is deuterium actually deuterium and helium helium and it produces helium 4 and 18 mev of energy so these are the four type of fusion reactions which are possible uh, on the uh, on earth but all these reactions are not very easy actually this the two dd two deuterium reactions one and two dd reactions are almost possible possible on the or possible and the third reaction dt dt uses tritium okay tritium uh, is not readily available on the surface of the earth it is available on oceans so extract is a difficult process but this is not a uh, you cannot discard this relation we will be using this type of fusion also but compared to the other uh, dd compared to dd this is not so easy but it is done okay so these two are easy reactions but its energy is less okay energy is 3.27 and 
whereas this produces 17.59 mg of energy but requires tritium extraction of tritium from oceans is not so feasible but uh, there are some process in which we can use this relation also this is uh, the most effective relation you can see uh, it, um, in the sense it produces 18.3 mev but you are spending uh, only 5 masses 3 plus 2 right 5 masses okay you are here it is 3 plus 3 6 masses you are using okay whereas this is uh, sorry sorry this uh, this also have 5 masses this also have 5 masses 3 plus 2 and 3 plus 2 but this produces 17.59 um, this produces 18.3 so using 3 plus 2 5 masses both produce energy but this produce more energy so deuterium helium 3 is most energy efficient we can say but the problem is helium 3 is not a, uh, not available on the surface of the earth helium 3 is not available on the surface of the earth in the in the um, recent chandrayaan and told one of the uh, aims one of the objectives of the mission was to search for helium 3 helium 3 so helium 3 is a helium 3 is present on the surface of the moon uh, but it is uh, very rare on the surface of the earth if we can extract uh, helium 3 from moon we can bring it over here and can be uh, can be used in this particular fusion it is not an easy task to bring something from moon here but uh, one of the uh, one of the future possibilities is that extract helium 3 from moon and to bring here and to have this particular fusion reaction so out of these four reactions first three are somewhat possible the first two are uh, somewhat uh, possible the third one is uh, because it requires tritium it is not so easy but it is in some way it is used we will see it in the next slides how it is employed and deuterium deuterium reactions can be used effectively used on the surface of the earth and it produces this relation produces actually 2 into 10 raised to 14 joule per, joule per kilogram on an average I am talking about the first two rela uh, reactions, deuterium, deuterium, and deuterium is abundant. One in seven thousand hydrogen atoms on the surface on the surface of Earth is deuterium. It is not so rare. So if you take seven thousand hydrogen atoms, one of them will be deuterium. Easy extraction methods are available for, for deuterium from ocean water, and hence deuterium qualifies as a future fusion fuel. And these one and two relations or DD reactions can be used as a uh, fusion source or the energy source uh, due to fusion on earth and this is actually if you have got two type of relations dd and dt dd reaction deuterium deuterium and dt means deuterium tritium so uh, this curve is actually fusion cross section or the reaction probability probability okay probability of reaction uh, versus neutron energy so both dt deuterium tritium reaction and the deuterium deut deuterium reaction both uses deuterium okay so this x-axis you have neutron energy or deuterium energy and y-axis you have the possibility or the probability of the relation you can see that this deuterium tritium has got more probability at, at a, say for, for, say a particular deuteron at say 10 raise to 2 you have a deuteron with a 10 square kev and if you look on to that look on uh, this dt reaction has got less probability than dt reaction so uh, for a particular energy of deuteron the dt reaction is more probable than dd reaction okay so that is what uh, this curve tells you so uh, when you talk about fusion on earth your ultimate aim is to build a fusion reactor like the fission reactor we have already in place you have a lot of fission reactors atomic reactors are all fission reactors uh, whatever atomic reactors we are referring to they are all fission reactors atomic fission is you a nuclear fission is uh, utilized so our ultimate uh, aim when we are discussing fusion on earth is to build a fusion reactor so what are the things in fusion reactor it is a controlled diffusion fusion is already controlled but uh, you have to have some uh, some sort of a uh, control method supplied it's already controlled but you have to have some sort of a control to uh, decide its output and uh, decide its rate etc etc and you uh, you require three major conditions to be satisfied to build a fusion reactor so what are those three conditions so we have already discussed these conditions the first condition is high temperature because fusion is thermonuclear in nature now so you require high temperature see uh, see this temperature of neutron is around uh, say uh, it happens only about 10 kev or about 9 kev whatever it is 9 kev only you can have uh, some sort of a probability 
so whatever reaction deuterium tritium or deuterium deuterium uh, you require some sort of a minimum energy so this uh, dt have got lesser energy so uh, the reaction probability for dt is more and also it happens at a lesser deuterium energy okay so um, uh, so this high temperature is a requirement the re temperature requirement is 100 to 1000 kev deutons have more reaction cross section okay from the previous paper so for this 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 area this area uh, if your deuteron is having uh, energy in this area you will have more reaction probabilities for both the reactions okay so that is one condition it uh, if you must have high temperature and you will have <coughs> high reaction probabilities and uh, already we have seen uh, another requirement is you will have sufficient number of nuclei that is called high density of nuclei. high number density of nuclei is also needed number of collision must be large in a given time then only the fusion will be sustainable right so not only high temperature but you require a high density of high number density of nuclei at a place to have an effective uh, fusion reactor fusion reactor then the condition for self sustainability there are two conditions to have self self sustainability sustainability means reliable and continuous operation of the fusion process nuclei should stand time till the fusion takes place uh, that is actually the confinement problem you know that uh, at high temperature this plasma particles or the uh, nuclei are not uh, sitting idle they are in movement they are in motion now so uh, to have fusion reaction they will be brought together okay so for a sufficient amount of time a sufficient minimum a minimum length of time two nuclei should be close enough so that is what is called confinement so nuclei should stand in time stand time till the fusion takes place so fusion will be taking place but this nuclei should be there in a close environment for a sufficient amount of time and that is called the confinement issues then the sec second is system should deliver more energy than what is spent or lost so we have already seen that to have fusion you have to bring two nuclei together so to bringing to for bringing them together you have to spend energy because you have to fight against the coulomb's force of repulsion so you are spending energy to extract energy no you are spending energy to effect fusion when you when you when your fusion is effective you will be extracting energy from fusion so you are giving energy and getting energy so there should be always i mean the uh, it should, it must be in a way that the uh, the energy you get must be greater than the energy you spent okay otherwise it is of no use the second aspect is the loss aspect uh, there will be lot of loss of energy from the environment so uh, the total loss uh, or the total energy spent that is the energy spent on bringing the uh, nuclei together and the loss in the system should be less than the um, should be less than the energy produced in fusion so that is system should deliver more energy than what is spent or lost so then only fusion reactors are possible so these are the three conditions high temperature environment must be there high density of nuclei must be present and cell cell sustainability issues there are two issues in connection with that one is the confinement the uh, the plasma must be confined and the other is the uh, actually the efficiency that is more energy should be produced than what is spent or lost okay so that means uh, there is a there is some critical conditions to be uh, maintained in the plasma in the fusion plasma so one such critical condition is critical ignition temperature so it is it is related to this sustainability sustainability actually see for cell sustainability energy released in fusion must be greater than the energy required to maintain the temperature so we have already uh, discussed that energy released in fusion must be greater than the energy required to maintain the temperature and also there will be radiation loss in the system and uh, wherever there is a temperature or a heat there will be some radiation loss that is called a bremsstrahlung radiation so that is actually produced due to deceleration of charged particles you have got uh, this uh, charged particles nuclei in a very uh, fast environment sometimes there will be deceleration so when these charged particles are decelerating you will have a radiation loss in the form of bremsstrahlung radiation so these two things are there one is the uh, energy required to maintain the temperature and other is the loss okay so uh, in the curve here in the graph here I have just plotted the loss this is the loss this straight line curve is the loss since both rate of production of fusion energy and rate of loss of radiation increase with temperature if you plot a graph so here with the temperature here 
and here you have the energy energy so you are plotting energy in the y axis and this curve is the this the, the straight line actually is the radiation loss which increases with the temperature okay and the other two curves are only for dt reaction and another is for dd reaction and it is actually the energy production rate okay it's actually energy production rate so this is the energy production rate of the dd dt reaction and this is the energy production rate of the uh, dd reaction okay dd reaction and this point say at this point of intersection actually this is the loss the loss uh, after this point this energy production rate is greater than the loss okay so this can be called as a critical temperature critical temperature so this temperature say 5 5 kev is the temperature for dt reaction below which below which uh, below this temperature the loss is more than the energy produced whereas above which this energy produced is greater than the loss so this is uh, the if you are using dt reaction then you should be using an energy of neutrons uh, you may, i mean uh, if you are using dt reaction uh, the the energy of neutrons must be greater than 5 kev below 5 kev loss is greater so that is called that there is a there is a critical ignition temperature actually critical ignition temperature for dt dd reaction if you look on to dd reaction this critical ignition temperature is around 40 kev okay 40 kev so below 40 kev the loss is more and above 40 kev the loss is less than the uh, rate of production of heat in the dd reaction okay so that is the concept of critical ignition temperature uh, above which rate of production overtakes the rate of loss so for dd and dt we have just shown the critical temperature and critical ignition temperature above which the rate of production of uh, energy is greater than the loss which is already in place so that is one criteria one thing another criterion is called a loss and criterion okay loss and criterion so again for sustainability we have the confinement issue the plasma confinement time must be sufficiently long i told you already plasma confinement time must be sufficiently long and also there should be higher density of plasma that is plasma density should also be large so lawson criterion propose a minimum value for the product of the two if you take the plasma confinement time there should be a minimum plasma confinement time and there should be a minimum plasma density we will just see but lawson tells you that this product nt must have a minimum value okay n and t must have a minimum value so nt must have a critical value should be greater than a critical value and this critical value is depending on the reaction cross section and energy produced etc okay so for each reaction this critical value will be different for example see this nt must be greater than 10 raised to 22 second per meter cube actually it is n into t n is uh, in per meter cube and t is in second that is if this unit comes uh, second per meter cube so nd must be greater than 10 raised to 22 s per meter cube for dd reaction and it must be greater than 10 raised to 22 uh, 20 s per meter cube for dt reaction okay so these are the two criterions one is the uh, critical ignition temperature and other is the lawson criterion and if you look on to the dt reaction see this dt reaction has got lesser nd no this critical value is lesser for this is 10 raised to 20 and this is 10 raised to 22 okay so dt has got lesser value of nd critical value of nd okay similarly your dt has got less value of for critical ignition temperature okay so that means your dt is a is better than dd okay your dt reaction is uh, will be better than dd in that sense you have lower critical temperature for dt and you have got lower nt value critical nt value low as per uh, loss and criterion for uh, dt so uh, but the problem is you cannot uh, have a, an easy dt because of the uh, tritium extraction issue okay you, i already told that tritium is not easy to extract but for in other terms dt is better because it has got lower ignition temperature and it has got lower critical value for nt but uh, so i told you tritium extraction is an issue uh, but d, uh, dt relation is better dt reaction is better so there is a one one way uh, for that uh, uh, i mean that uh, tritium is not uh, readily available and to be extracted but there is another way of extracting tritium that is using lithium so there is this is the relation this is actually the first relation we have already discussed dt relation 
1s2 plus 1s3 giving you 2h4 plus 1 neutron and 17.59 mav of energy that is the third relation we have already discussed third equation and here one neutron is produced right so if that one neutron strikes on a lithium 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 6 it produces tritium okay along with alpha particle helium okay so you if you just start this tritium uh, dt process this is actually dt process and one neutron is present and if that one neutron is used to collide on bombard on a uh, lithium 6 it produces tritium okay so once this process starts then it is like just like feeder reaction okay uh, the tritium produces tritium fission is happening here one neutron is produced and that one neutron goes and produces uh, goes and uh, hits on a lithium produces tritium again so it is just like feeder reactor right the fuel 1s3 is produced okay uh, and on each fusion of 1s3 or the tritium a neutron is produced the neutron is used to hit on lithium to produce tritium so it is the fuel is regenerated so this reaction is possible so once the dt starts the neutron produced will be used to produce tritium from lithium so if you have a tritium deut deuterium tritium plasma covered in a lithium envelope so that lithium may regenerate tritium and this reaction is uh, possible so fuel is generated uh, uh, automatically and this is called some sometimes we have the concept of breeder reactor so this is some type some sort of a breeder action in fusion okay so uh, that's all regarding the fusion uh, reactors now we will come to plasma confinement issue so we have been discussing uh, quite a long time that plasma confinement is a serious issue so what is plasma confinement you have to uh, have your uh, fusing nuclei in a particular place for a considerable amount of considerable length of time otherwise fusion will not be happening so you have to uh, make the fuel make the fusing particles fusing uh, nuclei available in a close uh, environment for a long time so that is what is called the plasma confinement so the problem is uh, in the plasma state uh, plasma state is already a high temperature state okay very huge temperature 10 raised to 10 kelvin or so so no vessels can handle it because all vessels will melt it you cannot uh, melt all vessels will melt so you cannot have a container uh, to uh, i mean to enclose this particular plasma and another problem is if you are taking it in a container so suppose you are finding out you are just you have just invented a material uh, which have very high melting point than the plasma temperature then also there will be a, there will be an issue plasma will lose heat by striking on walls okay when there is a wall plasma will go and strike on that uh, walls and uh, uh, there will be scattering losses energy losses and fusion not possible so there must be some other confinement method so what are the possible confinement methods for plasma on air there are three categories of confinement methods one is called pinch confinement or pinch method other is magnetic confinement and the third one is the inertial confinement so let us uh, just see uh, each of those confinement issues confinement problems in a very small, very very short way very, very uh, in a nutshell okay so what is pinch confinement so this is the, this picture explains what is pinch con confinement so you are applying very high current say approximately 10 raised to 6 ampere or greater uh, is passed through a dd or dt mixture deuterium deuterium or deuterium tritium mixture we are passing very high current so suppose this is the place we are just applying a current so uh, 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 applying an electric field so there will be these orange lines are all currents so whenever there are currents there will be currents uh, there will be magnetic fields around that okay you know that wherever there is a current passing you will be having uh, some sort of a magnetic field around that okay so this conduction of current is possible at high temperature simply because the plasma is in the ionized state so ionized state will carry current will conduct current so there will be conduction currents as indicated by this orange arrow and uh, circulating that there will be uh, the corresponding magnetic field wherever there is a current a magnetic field is there so here the the environment is we have the electric field and the current and you have the magnetic field and the charged particles of the plasma so uh, when uh, so with high current with high current this magnetic field will apply pressure will apply pressure okay now what will uh, how the plasma particles will move the plasma particles wherever there is a magnetic field a charge of particles will be will be trying to assemble around the magnetic field you know the cyclotron motion and all so wherever a magnetic field is formed this uh, charge of particles will be trying to assemble 
or they will be producing some sort of a cyclotron motion around the uh, magnetic field lines. So, when the intensity of the current is increased, the magnetic field is also increased and uh, that means those uh, particles will be applied pressure. Magnetic fields apply pressure and blind plasma uh, binds plasma to the axis. So, that effect is what is called the pinch effect. If you apply current, uh, when the current is larger, you will be having larger magnetic field and those larger magnetic field lines will be applying pressure to the plasma particles like this and this plasma will be confined to a very short area. So, this is where it is uh, narrowed down to a very small area where the fusion, fusion can happen. So, at sufficient pressure and compression, fusion starts. So, pinch effect is nothing but you are applying a current to a plasma so that these currents will produce magnetic field around that. That magnetic field will be compressing the plasma and they will be uh, narrowing down the, uh, the, the free area of the plasma and finally, uh, when they are narrowed down to very close environment, fusion will happen. So, this is called pinch confinement. But the process is very unstable. This is not used nowadays. Unstable plasma method not much successful also because there will be a lot of leakages because plasma particles will not be confined as we think. There will be leakages. They will not be coming uh, to this narrow restricted region. So, that is one problem. It is not so used pinch confinement. Now, the second confinement uh, we have mentioned is magnetic confinement. Magnetic confinement uses magnetic field to confine plasma. And this is the earliest successful plasma confinement. Uh, even now, even today, we are using um, plasma confinement using magnetic fields. Use a strong magnetic fields to confine plasma. There are two uh, methods of magnetic confinement. One is magnetic bottle and the other is toroidal confinement. Toroidal confinement, we call it otherwise as stellarator. Okay. So, let us see what is magnetic bottle. So, here, this is the concept, this figure. Uh, is actually the concept of magnetic bottle. Here uh, you must first of all think that these two lines, these two straight lines, it is not a container. It is not a container or anything, okay, because no container, it is it's only a, uh, it is a imaginary lines, okay. Uh, you have just, you have just an imaginary line, there is no container here, you just not confuse. And you have these coils, like your spring, you have a spring, right. So, spring, uh, you, you, may, uh, you are not winding the spring, or spring on anything. The spring, you just imagine a spring. So, that is the idea. So, these are some field coils through which the currents can be passed. And the, the coil density, the number density of the coil is more in the at the ends. So, here there are more number of coils per centimeter uh, than the middle portion. So, that means the, you know the principle of solenoid and all. Whenever a current is passing through a coil you will have the magnetic field and if the number of turns is more you will have a higher magnetic field. So, this is the magnetic field curve ok. At the two ends you have uh, larger number of coils so that you have a higher magnetic field when current is passed and at this point you will have this area you will have a steady standard constant magnetic field and this arrangement is called a magnetic bottle because this high magnetic field uh, is a hindrance to plasma motion ok. So, let us uh, so see how it happens. See here the, the, these are the field coils, these wound field coils and these are the field lines. You know that inside a coil, inside a coil the field will be straight line like this. Here there is larger magnetic field, uh, larger number of turns. So, the magnetic field have a deformed shape and a high magnetic field, okay. high magnetic field but will have a, uh, will have a dissimilar magnetic field than the uh, central portion. Okay. So, what is the principle? Current through field coils produce strong magnetic fields. So, this current, current through the field coils produce strong magnetic fields. At the ends, the number of turns is more and hence more magnetic field. Here, there is, you have a more magnetic field. Magnetic field is stronger. Okay. The plasma particles undergo helical motion around the field lines. I already told you, whenever there is a magnetic field line like this, the plasma particle will be having, will be just revolving around the uh, uh, revolving around this particular uh, field line and it will be a helical motion because there will be a velocity component and because of that velocity component that will be uh, if there is a field line uh, the particle will be undergoing a helical motion like this like this ok. But it, it very, when it comes to one end here, here, there it finds a very huge magnetic field ok. So, uh, so there he uh, the particle cannot penetrate Panic, the particle cannot go further so it comes uh, back. So, uh, this helical motion if it goes to the right side 
when it finds this higher magnetic field the helical motion now turns to the left side so it's an oscillatory motion like this it cannot go beyond these high magnetic field points so the plasma is trapped inside the two higher magnetic field stronger magnetic field points and that is why the term magnetic bottle comes so the particle pa the plasma particles undergo helical motion around the field lines and they are reflected back and forth at the stronger end fields and they are these end fields are sometimes called the magnetic mirrors 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 okay because they are reflecting at this point and plasma will be trapped and confined so this is the arrangement of magnetic bottle okay now there is another confinement that is called the uh, toroidal confinement toroidal confinement okay so what is toroidal confinement uh, that is uh, this is uh, this is the shape of a donut or this is actually a uh, toroid torus or whatever it is okay and this type of again this is not a vessel this is not a vessel these uh, coils are there these are the coils these are the field coils are there but uh, there is uh, no enclosure okay the enclosure is just shown for clarity okay whatever happens is what happens is there is a toroidal co coil carrying currents produce magnetic field lines parallel to the circumference of the toroidal tube okay so this toroidal tube the imaginary toroidal tube these field coils when you send current through these coils magnetic field will be these dotted lines actually represent the magnetic field dotted lines okay so currents are actually shown with the arrow mark uh, they are just uh, uh, curling around the toroidal shape like this okay and uh, so this is the field lines these are these dotted lines are the field lines and if plasma is here the plasma will be encircling this field lines in the in the helical motion okay so plasma confined in helical motion along the field lines but the problem is field will be stronger inside and weaker radially out so that is a problem of the toroid you will have stronger field inside here you will have stronger field and outside you will have lesser field that's because of some uh, some sort of a geometry of the figure here you will have low, stronger uh, low, i mean uh, weaker field and at this end inner side you will have stronger field so there will be a non uniform uniform magnetic field actually okay field lines is not field is not uniform so that means uh, there will be drift for the particles okay the particles will have a drift from the lower to higher field or from the higher to lower field whatever way uh, uh, they are drifting the particles will be nearing the i mean boundaries here there is a boundary and here you, there is a boundary okay so if the particles are encountering non uniform magnetic fields there will be a drift from lower to higher magnetic field or higher to lower magnetic field whatever it is so whatever ways they go they will be re reaching the boundary and there will be a, uh, a a tendency for the particle leakage okay so to compensate for that leakage we have just uh, modified the geometry so this is a geometry again the, the right side we have seen we have shown another geometry so here what is happening is whatever is happening in the right lobe or the right torus right toroid the opposite things will be happening in the left toroid okay so if one particle is going to the outer section outer uh, there is a tendency to go to the outer radius in the right lobe there will be that particle will be having a tendency to go to the uh, inner uh, i mean inner side of the uh, this uh, left lobe okay so uh, i will explain i will just tell once again so if a particle is uh, experiencing an outward drift means it, it is just going to uh, leak from this side a particle is experiencing an outward drift in this particular lobe opposite things will happen in the left lobe that is that particle will be having an inward push not an outward drift but an inward push in the, uh, the left lobe so that drift tendency is nullified when it completes one particle one complete uh, i mean helical motion so that is this geometry geometry uh, as in the second figure nullifies this leakage the two lobes are having opposite magnetic environment so whatever uh, leakage tendency is there in this lobe will be compensated uh, or the, that will be uh, i mean nullified in the left lobe that is the uh, so the, this geometry and this toroid confinement is also called stellarator okay and another toroidal confinement is called tokamak tokamak is actually a russian name actually this idea was uh, proposed and uh, realized by russians 
and tokamak is the russian uh, i mean abbreviation for toroidal chamber with the axial magnetic field toroidal chamber with the axial magnetic field so this is actually a toroidal uh, chamber toroidal chamber but uh, but there is one thing is that uh, here uh, there are two fields there are two fields that's actually a modified toroidal magnetic field okay actually here the, you have got a, a this type of a magnetic field this is called toroidal magnetic that dotted lines represent magnetic field so in the toro in the tokamak that magnetic field is already there this line that is called a toroidal magnetic field okay total magnetic field this magnetic field and in addition to that there is a poloidal magnetic field poloidal magnetic field is just like so you see the coils here so instead of coils you just imagine magnetic field so this if these two lines are magnetic field these dot lines are magnetic field these field coils they are actually current coils here but i assume them to be magnetic field so these two magnetic fields are there so that is what is shown here there is one magnetic field in this way and another magnetic field in this way so this is toroidal magnetic field this is toroidal magnetic field this this circle and this 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 etc are poloidal magnetic field poloidal magnetic field so combination of two magnetic fields is applied to the plasma and plasma will have an helical motion inside that that helical motion is shown here and that helical motion is actually confined to the center of this toroid that means the leakage problem will be nullified the plasma will not be going to the sides will not be going to the boundaries the plasma will be confined to the uh, center of the toroid so that is the effect of this poloidal magnetic field okay this poloidal magnetic field just encircles if this is a magnetic field with this poloidal magnetic field just encircles the um, poloid so that uh, the particle cannot escape to the boundary so these two magnetic fields used together uh, is actually tokamak this uh, uh, okay so this path of confined plasma is helical here the poloidal magnetic field is produced by a current induced in the plasma that is another thing toroid we know how it is produced toroid magnetic field is as in the previous picture but this poloidal magnetic field is induced that is this magnetic field this this magnetic field okay is induced by a current in the plasma you are inducing you will be inducing a current in the plasma and that current will produce this magnetic field and that is the idea of toroidal confinement using tokamak so tokamak is a very very uh, revolutionary idea uh, in the many fusion uh, experiments and in a very fusion laboratories nowadays we are using tokamak for plasma confinement we have uh, we have one plasma laboratory in ahmedabad in india that is institute institute for plasma research where we have tokamak uh, and uh, one fusion reactor uh, is uh, being generated being just designed for the first time fusion reactor is not realized so far but it is being designed it is being um, uh, generated being uh, it is just uh, in the phase of making out so we are just constructing a fusion reactor in france and that is called uh, uh, iter international thermal thermal uh, thermonuclear experimental reactor fusion reactor iter international thermonuclear experimental reactor so in that uh, iter also uh, we are using this tokamak for plasma confinement that uh, nuclear fusion reactor is not realized uh, even today it will take another 5 to 10 years to uh, be operational it to be operational and another confinement the third confinement which we have this we have to discuss is inertial confinement inertial confinement is a different process it is not neither magnetic nor electric no magnetic field or current is used instead the technique is very simple deuterium tritium pellets are produced Radi it is not radius 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 of 0.1 millimeter deuterium tritium pellets with a radius of 0.1 millimeter are heated and compressed they are heated and compressed using high power laser beam or electron or ion beams using laser beam or electron beams we are just uh, heating uh, deuterium tritium pellets of very small radius of 0.1 millimeter and they are being compressed when they are compressed uh, beyond a particular value implosion implosion is an inward explosion okay inward uh, expansion so there is there is an explosion like thing explosion is always outward and implosion is inward and the, when there is an implosion it the, the temperature rises to the critical ignition value that means fusion requires a critical ignition temperature so uh, uh, when these deuterium tritium pellets are uh, compressed using this high power laser also at one time implosion takes place and the temperature rises to 10 raise to uh, uh, minus 10 uh, 10 raise to 10 kelvin or so uh, which is a critical ignition value and fusion takes place in a very short time 
okay a series of such pellets if ignited in succession one after the other then you can get a supply of steady stream of fusion and steady stream of fusion and so this is inertial confinement process okay uh, so i think uh, we have uh, uh, just um, discussed the uh, second part of the nuclear fusion almost in detail uh, and uh, fusion reactors uh, are uh, not in real are not uh, a reality even today but in the coming future uh, fusion, i think we can hope that fusion reactors will come into place and will replace the fusion reactors already in place uh, so uh, that completes this lecture thank you